and welcome back to the Guidewell Insights Lounge. My name is Kate Warnock. I'm delighted to bring you Mr. Paul Black. Paul, welcome to the interview. Thanks, Kate. Paul is the CEO of All Scripts, and Paul, I know that you're here today to present about how genomic data is reshaping healthcare. What are the top points that you're going to be making in your presentation? Well, Kate, three things. Number one, we think that uh, the blending of genomic data with phenotypic data really is a game changer for the industry and for our platform specifically. Secondly, we have one of the largest installed base of primary care and specialty group practices in the United States. And around the globe, we have a very large presence in inpatient and in ambulatory settings. So they, they connect, reconnecting that installed base with this new medical insight to give more precise capabilities to the care and management of these chronic diseases we think is extraordinarily insightful and important. And thirdly, from a consumer standpoint, we're going to grant access from a consumer basis to their data and give them capabilities to grant for them to grant consent of their records to clinical trials, to large organizations that might want to know uh, more about their condition as they traverse the, the um, path of being cared for in multiple different institutions across, in some cases, the globe. So does that mean, too, that you're really going to enable better patient access to their own data? We are. We are, and we do that today. And that's certainly a big call. I know uh, if you monitor social media, there's there's a huge movement for um, you know patient access and, and really patient voice, too. So I think having that kind of hands-on uh, uh, access is, is really going to move the needle forward, so I'm excited to hear that. Thanks. Um, so Allscripts has embraced an open philosophy. We have. And um, I wondered why you took this strategic approach when you certainly could have gone a very different direction. Well, I think that all industries start out being closed and they end up, end up being open after a period of time. If you, no matter, you know, pick any industry and you look at it from that regard. Our philosophy is one that's been based uh, on this premise for over um, 10 years. And that philosophy is based on the fact that we think there's other people out there who may have better ideas than ours in some cases. And importantly, we're able to reach out to some 2,000 plus um, application developers who are in, in, uh, in, in, innovating on top of our platform each and every day. So that can be anything from a, uh, an Apple application to in some cases our clients are using it to build additional very specific workflows on top of the way that they treat their patients in that city or that community in that country, which may be different from geography to geography. So I'm sure that you're seeing your data is being applied in ways that you never even imagined with having such an open platform. And you we, said 2,000 developers are, yeah, are already We have 160 uh, application program developers and we have 60 clients. So okay. each one of those people have app, uh, developers inside of their organization, but all totaled, we have 2,000 registered developers who are, have been certified in order to access our API platforms. Understood. Yeah. Well, Paul, looking back around to your, across your background, I know that you are very well uh, steeped really in health information technology. You've probably seen evolution upon evolution of it. You also know the challenge of taking an organization that might have some legacy systems in place, yep. and they really need to decide when do they do that investment, when do they do the upgrade. How is it that you counsel business on when is the right time to move forward? And what's the cost of not upgrading? Sure, I think that um, obviously the cost of not upgrading in the United States over the course of the last two, two years has been rel relatively punitive with the meaningful use mm -hmm. uh, incentives and now the penalties. Outside the United States and in other parts of the world, I think it's just important to stay current not only with the technology platform but with the applications themselves. From an application um, um, developer perspective, it's difficult for us to have multiple different back levels of code that sit out there and it's in everybody's benefit for us to be able to iterate and for us to innovate on top of one existing platform versus multiple different versions of an older one. So it is important um, for them to stay current not only from a regulation standpoint, but also that's where all the new found um, workflows are going to be and that's where all of our development dollars are going into. And then secondly, I think some of our clients have a challenge from an IT perspective of being able to stay current from an economic standpoint. And in many cases, they're coming to us to outsource their IT or they want us to host their systems for them, which we're um, happy to do. And we only get to do that on their behalf if we sign up for um, certain SLAs, as well as we have to do it in a more cost-effective manner than they're able to do it, which we've been able to demonstrate we can do that as well. Obviously, you can scale, and yeah. it's a lot easier for you to scale than an individual provider, I'm sure. It has been, yeah. yeah. So I want to pivot real real quickly, um, Paul. 
you know, you're the former chairman of the Truman Medical Centers, which is a safety net hospital system in Kansas. Um, I'm sure that you have some very specific insights into how legislation might be enhanced so that more people receive the right kind of care. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, we believe at Truman, I have my Truman um, board hat on, not my Allscripts hat on now. We think it's very important for the states to opt in on the Medicaid programs. A uh, very high percentage of our population is the underserved and a very poor population in the state of Missouri. So it's right on the border of Kansas, Missouri. I'm that's just okay. Sorry about that's that. okay. Kansas and City, I that, like to say. <laughs> that's okay. No problem. But um, we think that if the states have not opted in, at a minimum, they need to make sure that they spend um, an extra amount of dollars on the safety net organizations because there is a very specific role in every single community that a safety net hospital provides for the underserved who all need just as much health care healthcare as those of us who have health insurance. So we are very proud of the service that we provide in that um, part of the world and we think that the funding for that um, comes not only from the U.S. government but also local governments but also in many cases from a lot of philanthropy that we all do. Um, that all could be substantially enhanced and we could serve a broader piece of the population if the Medicaid enhancements are adopted by each, each individual state. Understood. Well, I appreciate that perspective. And Paul, sure. thank you so much for spending your time with us here at the Guidewell Insights Lounge. Hope you enjoy the rest of the summit. This is Kate Warnock. We'll be back again with you in just a moment. Thank you, Kate.